Uh, hey, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. Uh, Sam Masri, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for SAP in Canada. Um, I'm going to ask Tony to join me to the stage in uh, 15, 20 minutes to talk about the results of the uh, Digital Transformation Survey that we, uh, we started uh, four years ago and we run every year. And the 2019 results just came out uh, literally three weeks ago and wanted to share with you uh, where we uh, see the uh, state of digital transformation uh, in Canadian businesses is. Before I do that, I was asked to share with you uh, a perspective on what's happening globally as it comes to digital transformation. I uh, had the uh, fortune through my work to uh, do projects in 30 countries across four continents. And uh, it's really fascinating to see what's happening uh, globally and then compare that with what's happening in Canada and what is it that we can learn or maybe uh, in some cases we're actually ahead. Um, do we have a clicker? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so um, before I give you some examples on this thing called the intelligent enterprise and share with you the perspective on what, what makes an enterprise intelligent and some stories and strategies of these intelligent enterprises, I want to share with you a study that we did globally uh, so that you can compare the Canadian results that Tony will share with you with what's happening worldwide. We did a study last year with 3,000 companies across 17 countries mm -hmm. on how successful they are in terms of their digital strategies and the execution of digital strategies. And we found that only 3% are reporting that they're happy with their execution. It's much better today. And uh, again, I'm not going to steal uh, Tony's uh, thunder, but he's going to share with you what that means for Canada. But what was interesting is that companies of all sizes, of all industries, who responded to the survey, the biggest, and I think it goes back to the last question you asked, not on cybersecurity, but in general, on where do we start? Like, there's all of these amazing things that are happening, but where do we start? And that's an important question because in the 2016, 17, 18, and 19 surveys, every single one of them for four years, it all goes back to something very intuitive, the data, right? How clean and how organized and how structured that data is. And you would think that we're in 2019, that should be way behind us. It's not. So the question, we have 16,000 customers for SAP in Canada every year, we do anywhere between 50 to 70, I would say, corporate transformation projects that are driven by technology change. Every single time we ask the customer, are you looking to collect data or are you looking to transform data? It's a fundamental, seemingly simple question. But the core for any success that we've seen in a digital transformation strategy is whether you're transforming data. And I'll explain in a second what I mean by transforming data. GM, 2011, had a $55 billion valuation. They collect data. They've been collecting data at that point of time for 103 years. They did not transform data. Tesla started transforming data. And I'll show you some examples of what Tesla is doing today. In 20. 11, their value was 2.5 billion. Fast forward 2018, Tesla is as big as GM. They managed to create value by transforming data in six years. As much value as GM took in 111 years. And I checked on the weekend actually, they surpassed GM uh, in 2019. They're three billion uh, dollar bigger in terms of value. So. Before I give you some examples of what Tesla is doing, um, a lot of our customers ask us all the time, like, what's new about this? Like, why is transforming data today such a big deal as it pertains to being successful in your digital strategy? I mean, the mainframe was based on digital data. Internet was based on digital data. Like, what, what, why are you expecting this disruption and large-scale change? And but when I say large-scale transformation projects, just so you know, and I'm, you know, I, I would say. We have a lot of friends at Microsoft and IBM and many of the other big uh, software providers, and they, they will tell you the exact same thing. The number of projects that we're seeing to do large-scale transformation has gone by 100% year over year for the last four years. People are actually doing a change, and Tony's going to talk, talk much more about that as well. But why are they doing that now? And it's something, it's a hypothesis that I presented in ET, actually, I think three years ago in Montreal. It's about five key things happening in the marketplace, in the industry. 
that is allowing us to create this massive level of disruption with digital. And it's not one or the other, it's the fact that all of them are maturing now at the exact same time. Something that didn't happen, like it's something that happens every generation or so. One is hyperconnectivity. Everything is connected. Today, on average, every human being has a cell phone. Yesterday, you guys heard about 5G and the implications of 5G. Sensors are much cheaper. You can censor everything up. Second one is supercomputing and data science. AI machine learning is, is not, it has never been more real than today, but it's not new. I studied AI when I did engineering many, many years ago. But the cost of supercomputing to do AI and machine learning is declining 20% year over year, which means that a student graduating today, unlike me many years ago, is, has access to supercomputing and can create an AI-based application today and disrupt an industry. That was, not, that was only possible for the mega rich, um, old guard, big R&D organizations in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Today it's available for everyone. The third one is cloud. 90% of every newly created business goes to the cloud. It's just agile, nimble, you don't need to worry about the operation, someone's doing it for you so that you can focus on your core differentiators, you can innovate easily, it's quick, it's nimble. Smart world is what we call back then this. It's a family of innovations that help you connect the virtual with the physical. Think about virtual reality, augmented reality, robotics, 3D printing, uh, biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, all of that stuff. I think at the, at the time we were predicting that you know, companies will be able to print bridges. In the last couple of years there is a, you know, in Amsterdam, they couldn't build a bridge in downtown Amsterdam because of the traffic and all the complexity that comes with it. So they're like, you know what, we'll just print it. They print the bridge and they moved it to town and guess what, they did it cheaper and faster. These things are real now. And the last one is blockchain. When we talked about it three years ago, it was a very nascent concept, was people thought it could be hyped. Guess what? It's not. It has real implications or applications. Back then, we talked about the first transaction that happened from Alberta Treasury Board uh, to Germany. And they did it in 20 seconds, if you recall, in 2016. We were rock bottom in terms of the oil industry. And some of the equipment manufacturers were running out of business because they're not getting cash back in time. So with blockchain, they were able to get, allow some of these equipment manufacturers access to their cash in 20 seconds, a case that used to take two or three days in the past. That was three years ago. Today, blockchain is in all industries. But again, and I can't stress this enough, it's not one or the other. It's all of them getting to a point of maturity and commercialization that companies can do crazy disruptive things when they combine them together. And that's transforming data. So if you go back to the Tesla example, take them one by one. The car is hyper-connected. If you didn't have 4G, you didn't send all of the information that's collecting to the, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, the headquarters. And I'll explain now why they're doing that today, like sending it to the headquarters. It's censored up, right? It's doing AI and machine learning, supercomputing in real time so that you can drive safely and protect the safety of those who are around your car. And, most, and all the thing, everything is in the cloud. And they're connecting all of that back to the mechanics of the car, which is the smart world. It's connecting the virtual with the physical. When I was growing up, I never thought that I would trust the car driving me. Like, to me, honestly, guys, like, just think of it. Like, this was science fiction. It's actually happening today. I still wouldn't trust myself in, in, in that car today, but that's, that's uh, probably old school. But I know that I will not have an option soon. And uh, one of the things that they're doing today is uh, that I find, find uh, fascinating. Do you guys use Waze, the mobile app for traffic? Yeah? So they're kind of doing something similar where they're actually making this car collect all of this data from the streets it's driving in. They're sending all of that to the headquarters and then they're pushing all of that data out again to other Tesla cars so that before you get to a specific neighborhood, you know exactly what to expect. You know if there is a traffic accident, you know if there is congestion, you know if there is whatever it might be. That's transforming data. And that's how a company created more in value in six years than another company created in value in 111 years. It's all of these technologies being combined in one business application to create change. So what is intelligent enterprise? If Tesla is intelligent enterprise at the back of all of this. And the, w the way I define it or we define it is a company that transforms data into action Insight first and then action. 
to do one of four things. And these are the four things that we're seeing most intelligent enterprises use these technology innovations to create value. The first one is process automation. Step change in productivity. I go back to your question. I, you know, I know that I stepped in the last few minutes, but your question is, it opens a flood of other questions. Because a lot of people say, you know, AI machine learning, hey man, I can't do my invoice matching. Can you help me with that? Like there is so many quick wins that we can do at an enterprise level before we get into the next level of innovation. Some companies like Tesla is already there. Others are not. Many other. You're gonna see it when Tony talks about it. Like, you know, people are seeing a lot of, a ton of value from productivity. And I expect that between now and 2025, most value is gonna be created, with the exception of the one or two unicorns and flyers that we will see, like the Teslas. We hear about them all the time because they created well, how many are they? You look at all of the other organizations, there is a ton of value that can be created from simple productivity change using these technologies. The second one is the way that you engage your workforce. And we know now that 70%, you're 70% 70 more likely to create a better customer experience if your own employees are engaged. The third one is that memorable customer experience. And the fourth one is getting into completely new business models. Now, in the time that we have, because I want Tony, I want Tony to come up in, on stage in a second, I'm going to talk about the first two, but I'll be here all day and we can chat about the other two if you guys are interested. So the first one is redefining customer experience. How can you, as an intelligent enterprise, transform data to create a good customer experience? Excuse me. So this is a roller coaster schematic, a beautiful piece of engineering. When I saw this, it reminded me of most of our businesses, right? So many things going on, everything is interconnected, ton of operations going on for you to decide the speed, the velocity, the acceleration, the safety of your riders. That's the operational data. I call it O data, okay? Then there's the experience data that we don't spend as much time on. So these two women are seemingly having fun about to start the ride. You'd agree? You're okay? Minute later, they're both still having fun. One is a bit more excited than the other, but they're still both having fun. And then moments later, one of them is terrified, I guess, and the other one is still having fun. She's actually having so much fun that she has the ability to still hold her friend's hand and comfort her. You don't know how you do that. Do you think the woman in white is having fun at this specific moment? I'll tell you, my wife was one day next to me in one of these roller coasters, and the smack I get on my head after, <laughs> after the ride <laughs> told me that she wasn't having fun. Um, imagine, so, so they captured that moment. So we're, capture, we're collecting the data, right? And they're selling this picture. But imagine if based on this information, because this roller coaster goes into two or three iterations, or three, two or three circuits. Imagine the second circuit, you've collected this, you realize that the one on the left, if the whole concept of the theme park is to create more rush, more excitement, more craziness, the next time you do this, the woman in green, there is a water gun to her left that would splash her in water on her way down in the, deep, in, in the, in the you know, steepest slope. But the one on the right, you don't do that for because you probably, you know, you don't want her to have a heart attack. <laughs> so Cirque du Soleil does that today. It's not a theme park. By the way, theme parks are one of the most laggards when it comes to digital transformation. They haven't moved an inch, mostly, compared to retail or financial services or some of the other industries or entertainment or sport. So in Cirque du Soleil, we've done, one of the things that we've done with them is that we started helping them in some of their shows, not all of them, capture audience Expe uh, feedback in real time and feed that information back to the producers while the show is running. And they would do changes to the show while the show is, ru ru is running in terms of lighting, color, steam, things happening in the show. And most recently, and this, this was just uh, announced uh, two, two months ago in the New York Fashion Show, they started integrating this. Uh, so let me take a, a pause for a sec. The reason we're able to do this today is uh, we realize that as an operational company that is very, very well known for running operations, we run 78% of the world's transactions, we didn't have access to experience data. We didn't have access or give that access to our customers. So we acquired a company that was the leading company in the marketplace called Coltrex, if you heard of it, for $8 billion early in this year. 
that does experience management perfectly. And the whole question, the reason why we did it is because we were the best suited in the industry to, because we own the operations data. We were the most suited in the industry to take that X data, the experience data, and connect it to the operational data and help companies like this take operational action in real time automatically without human intervention based on the feedback that we're getting. So what, what, uh, what uh, we did with Coltrix at Cirque is that we installed with the help with, of, of uh, technology fashion designers, built costumes for the performers that has the Coltrix customer experience technology built into the costume. And it asks you a few, so you go in before the show starts and you interact with the performer, which is an amazing experience on its own if you guys have been in one of these shows. And it asks you a few questions that the survey is like on a small kind of panel on their arm. And you, they ask you a few questions, and based on it, they detect the level of stress that you have. If you're going to the show on a Friday, end of Friday, you know, it's the end of the week, and you're stressed out and still have it unwinded from the week. And based on it, in the same outfit, they create a cocktail for you, a lavender-infused cocktail for you to kind of drink that drink and relax before you get in the show. Or they create a personal, personalized-made perfume. This is... This is happening today. Like if you go to one of their latest shows, they have that today. This is taking experience, putting it into operations that create whole new different experiences that would want you to go to that show again. Another example is, do you guys, does anyone have this shoe? Anyone, is, any runners here? This is the uh, Hover Infinite. It was 2019's uh, best running shoe uh, in the world by Under Armour. And they use Coltrix the exact same way. They used to use 100 testers to collect information from the users. And with the technology platform, they were able to scale it to 10,000. And they took input literally from 10,000 people and they used all of that to design their new shoe. And guess what? Easily it, it, it won the, uh, the, uh, the runner shoe of the year in 2019. 100% growth in the one category that they have, just at the back of one shoe. The last example here, um, before I switch to the second topic, is uh, this is, uh, if there are any football fans here, the, the stadium of the uh, San Francisco 49ers. And um, if you guys think that we're running bit like complex, I'm, I'm a COO, I run operations, and I always thought that I run a complex business. I saw this and I was like, I, I felt so good. <laughs> the amount of work that goes into running one of these events is just unbelievable. At any given show, 70,000, or any given game, 70,000 fans, 15 parking spots, 15,000 parking spots, 3,500 employees mobilized for just that one day, full-time, part-time contingent, run retail stores, food and beverage, security, ticketing, parking, you name it. So they said, we want to give a great experience. We run the, these operations, but we, want, we don't want to report on how the event has gone after the event is over to you know, improve for the next round. We want to know what's happening in real time. So with supercomputing and some, other of the, you know, some of these technologies that we talked about, they created what they call the executive huddle. And they grab all of their executives and put them in one room while the game is actually going. And they have one big screen, you'll see it here, called digital boardroom that has all, and for those of you who are technical, you, do, you realize how extremely complicated this is to, to, uh, to be done many years ago. All of that data from all of these things that I mentioned, parking, ticketing, food and beverage, security, all of it in one view. And then they look each other in the eye, parking's not going well, go fix it. And no one wants to be embarrassed, like they're all very senior executives, right? So in real time, they're taking action to make sure that every single experience happening at the stadium is a really good experience. And it changed the way that their fans interact with the game in a, in a whole different way. So that's in customer experience. This is how these technologies and data transformation is allowing intelligent enterprises to create amazing experiences. I'll take one more and then uh, we'll, we'll switch to Canada. So uh, how, are we, how are some of these intelligent enterprises using data transformation to create producti more productivity? or process automation. The first example I'll give you, while it's not the most kind of relevant to private sector enterprise commercial businesses, but it literally was uh, announced 20 days ago, I think October 16th, Doug, uh, was with the World Tennis Association, where with these guys, uh, we're now using AI machine learning image recognition to predict in real time how every single player in WTA would respond to every single shot. 
and feed all of that information back to the coaches. So the coaches can help their players win. For example, like, two real examples. If someone you know, returns a ball to you at the far right end corner of the field and you're playing against Joe Smith, Joe Smith is 61.8% likely going to return that ball to you in the middle right corner of the field. So you have to position yourself in a way that allows you to get to that spot more easier, easier than going to any other spots. Or when you toss the ball to serve, based on where the ball goes, like you know, does it like you know go slightly to the right or slightly to the left? Based on that, with a 99% confidence, you would know it's going to hit the left corner of your serving box. And based on that, you position. And a lot of people says like, you know, what's the point of this? Like you're ruining sports. But the beauty about it is that if you, if both players have access to that data, you know that I know that you know how I'm going to play and I know that you know how I'm going to play, it becomes playing poker and tennis at the same time. How entertaining would that be? Another example is, uh, this is more uh, relevant to our day-to-day -day businesses. It's a comp company called BASF. It's a giant chemicals company in Germany. They do more in revenue than any Canadian company, like $100 billion in revenue. And they invoice $100 billion, and they need to match all of these invoices with payments. Um, how many of you guys do that manually today in your businesses, if you know the answer? How many of you have it fully automated? So everyone is somewhere in between. They asked us to automate it for them. So we started with the basic automation, with you know, basic invoicing in ERP, and we helped them match 40% of their invoices to the payments. Wasn't enough. Every one percentage points is worth millions of dollars in savings. So they said, do more. So we started introducing complex rules and exception handling and all of that. We took it up 70%. They said, not enough. Just to give you an example, another 10 percentage point, they can go and buy another company, right? So we introduced machine learning. And the system started learning on its own. And gradually, over time, it's still improving. We're at 94%. Last example I'll give you is probably, um, do we have time for one more? Yeah, okay. This is a gross one, guys. Um, I'm gonna share it with you because it's important for everyone's health. It's about seafood. Um, have you guys heard about the scandals in the media recently about the origination and the mislabeling of seafood products across the world and in Canada? They found in a study, I think it was last year, that 44% of the seafood that we eat is mislabeled. Globally, 44%. Um, and I think what brought this to light was a Huffington Post feature that found that what was being presented as calamari, I don't remember if it was a grocery store or a restaurant, was actually a pig's anus. So in Canada, we have a professor in London, Ontario. Her name is uh, Jennifer McDonald. She said, you know what? I'm going to challenge my students to go out and test whether this is actually applicable to us in Canada. She said, I want you to go out and test nine seafood products in local grocery stores. And they found that two out of the nine were rightly labeled. And seven were mislabeled. Of the seven, most of them were uh, just substitu substituting for cheaper s seafood, like you know, Atlantic salmon versus Pacific salmon, which is just fraud. But in some other cases, they found, in one case, they found that um, <laughs> Uh, one fish that was labeled as a cute, nice white tuna was escolar. If you guys know what escolar is, it's like one of the most vicious fishes ever. That if, if you eat it, like you know, it creates massive distress to di through a di digestion system, digestive system. Uh, it's actually legally uh, banned for human consumption in many countries, including Japan. But the one that kind of threw me off and makes me think three times before I order seafood is that the, the, one, of the, one of the samples, they didn't find any fish DNA. They found human DNA in Canada, guys. So we did this project with a company called Bumblebee Tuna, because um, one of the five trends that we talked about, we talked about supercomputing, hyperconnectivity, cloud, smart world, but we didn't talk about blockchain. So we started using blockchain to help everyone know exactly the path that a tuna fish had taken from the time it was caught in an Indonesian sea, 
This is Rafer who works for the company. And you know, we tracked it from the time he went 17 kilometers into the sea, eight hours later he caught this big tuna fish. And we got that fish, we put all of the information on a blockchain, then we sent it to the plant, it did all the tests. Again, in a secured way, put all of that information on a blockchain, and then they made all of that information available for uh, suppliers and restaurants in North America. They would look at all of the features, and based on it, they decide what do, they, what do they want to eat, and I know with confidence that I'll be eating something that is actually what it says it is. Um, so in, in summary, and uh, Tony, if you'd like to join me here, I think uh, um, five things happening, these five trends that are happening are allowing us to transform data today. You transform this data, you become an intelligent enterprise when you do one of these four things. Um, and, um, and with that said, Join me in welcoming Tony. He's the group vice president for IDC. He's a friend. We've been running this survey for four years now. Um, and um, we'll just kick it off. Um, how many did we survey this year? What are the main findings? So this year, we, we took a focus on the intelligent enterprise. So you defined it. I thought that was really good. We've done um, the study. This is our fourth year. We moved from digital transformation, which I think I really characterize as the journey, whereas the intelligent enterprise is almost like the aspirational end state. And we surveyed 303 Canadian organizations, and that was companies with $50 million or more in revenue and at least 100 employees. So kind of mid-market and above with a, a bigger, bigger enterprise focus. So what? Were, so just for everyone to kind of get up to speed, what are, so we've been doing this for four yeah. years and we're trying to assess the level of digital maturity of Canadian businesses. What did we find this year and how does it compare to the previous years? So what we found this year is that we have progressed in terms of establishing a digital strategy. Um, in 2017, I think about 74% of uh, organizations had a strategy. Now it's up to 85%. So that's good, but I, you know, we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about having a, a strategy is one thing, executing it is, is a whole other um, challenge, right? And I think that's the, the reason that we're here. Um, key findings were what we were looking at in the intelligent enterprises. First of all, do you have the technology building blocks in place? Do you, are you using cloud strategically? Do you have data analytics um, established a, a good practice and competency area? Uh, are you doing um, things collaboratively? Do you have the right technology in place to collaborate across disparate teams? That's a big challenge, but it, it's a building block, and we've been on that collaboration journey for 20-something years in the Canadian market. And, and also the, the productivity solution. So tech readiness, organizational readiness was another big one. Right? So looking at um, the company's culture, and there's a, an interesting finding that we'll talk about in a few minutes about you know, the importance of enthusiasm. So do they have the technology building blocks in place? Are they organizationally ready? And then finally, um, or fundamentally, do they have a digital strategy in place? So what we wanted to do was understand and learn from those who have really separated themselves from, from the pack. So um, we can talk a little bit about So, so the you organize them in different categories in terms of their digital maturity. I think leaders was one category and then there's laggards and or observers? Yeah, exactly. So leaders are the 12% that really stood out. They had uh, distinguishing characteristics around uh, building block technology, organizational readiness, and that strategy in place. So 12%, not very many organizations. At the far end, the digital observers, so the basic laggards, that's about 11%. So it's not overwhelming for Canada. We have a bunch of companies in the, in the middle two categories, which we call participants and challengers, right? So about 42%, the biggest category was in that second stage. And I characterize them as they've, they're doing a lot of things right. They have some of the you know, fundamentals in place in terms of building blocks, but they're not, they haven't stretched that capability across the, the full uh, sets of lines of business. So they might have it piloted, uh, they might have a, a transformation strategy in sales and marketing, and they're doing some cool things around um, you know, customer experience in, in, a, in a small area, but they haven't built that enterprise-wide capability. So that is the yeah. biggest thing that Canadian organizations need to do is, is really learn from one area and, and have that move across different parts of the organization. So you should have get into how they're measuring their success with experience. So I'll, I'll, I wanna ask you about that in a second, but just to comment on one, one thing that you mentioned, which is 
one of the four uh, blocks of ensuring success in execution is the data management services, going back to what we were just talking about and data transformation. And maybe just sharing an insight from what we're seeing in the market. Uh, I don't know if you guys know or not, um, but there is a product that we have called S4, S4 HANA. It's the next generation ERP system that we have. Uh, we've been running ERP systems for a very, very, very long time and we introduced this uh, solution a few years ago. And all of the SAP existing customers who have ERP from SAP are trying to move into S4. And, um, and when, they, when they try to do that, um, our recommendation is always you have to start with the data strategy. You have to understand the metadata, you have to understand your um, uh, data services and all of that before you use this as a reason for you to kind of clean up your data and, and have a proper data model in place. And um, what we see is that in many cases CIOs get pressured to get results and to go live to the point where you know, we'll do that, but we'll get to it once we just launch finance or once we launch the new next generation supply chain. And then three out of four times we're finding that when, when they do that, and then you don't do the proper groundwork and the foundational work on, on, on the data services layer, and three out of four times the project fails. Going back to, like, and that's yeah. in my, like, as intuitive as it sounds, that's one of the four components that you mentioned makes it for a leader, uh, a digital leader in Canada, that they actually do that. Absolutely, and we, we complemented the survey with five detailed interviews with um, SAP Enterprise customers. So uh, one of them was with uh, Toronto Hydro. So Rob Wong, who's the CIO there, said, you know, fundamentally what we had to do is fix our IT shop. So do the things that you were talking about and, and build that uh, foundation in place because without that, they couldn't scale up, they couldn't um, work on some of the challenges that they're now facing with the grid we have lots of new workloads on, on the power grid. Um, he's you know, dealing with electric vehicles and, and new types of um, products and services that are plugging into the grid. So um, he can't get into a discussion with the operational technology folks, which by the way, IT is now merging closer to, and we saw that in a few interviews, until they have their own shop in order, so to speak. So um, Rob Wong was really, he was enthusiastic about, you know, making sure they had those fundamentals in place before they talked about, you know, transforming for the sake of transforming. So talk to me about experience management, because I think one of the two things that, so when we ask the question, how do you measure your success in your digital transformation journey, there were two things, either the experience we were offering to our customers or the experience we were offering to our employees. Yeah, the enterprise leaders that we found had those two measures as one and two. So customer experience and employee experience were the top two measures of digital success. So that, that to me, was really eye-opening because we focused on experience management this year for the first time. And, um, you know, there's, there's always been an undercurrent about digital transformation being about uh, customer experience, but that fact that employee experience was now uh, interwoven into that was an interesting. Um, leaders also had seen the benefit of, of kind of gluing those two initiatives together. So the better employee experience you have, the greater ability you have to have empathy for the customer. So um, in last year's study in 2018, we, you know, we talked to an organization that said, before we did anything with the customers, we worked through some of those details internally to see what it was like to, to do the buyer's journey at you know, opening a, a branch at a bank or something like mm -hmm. that. So until the employees can really have empathy for the customer experience, um, you're only going to go so far. So that was, you know, a, a pretty interesting finding this year. So maybe switching gears just a tiny bit, uh, Tony, I think this is something that you and I are both very passionate about. When we launched the survey first time in 2016, we were interested to understand the level of executive involvement in digital transformation. Do you view digital transformation as an IT project or do you view it as a business transformation project? And we didn't know, we had a hypothesis, but we didn't yeah, know yeah. what to expect. And I think the results in this year's survey specifically on that topic was, was very insightful to me. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. The first time ever we've asked this question about which departments are enthusiastically engaged in your digital strategy, and the two that stood out for the leaders were the IT department, which is kind of a no-brainer, but executive management. So if those two groups are not enthusiastically engaged in, in digital, they will, you know, organizations will not um, achieve that success. So. I, I like the, the term enthusiastically engaged because in, in many cases I, I've seen is that 
you know, we would make me with a CEO or the CIO that would say, hey, the CEO is fully behind us. We're, we've got this. And the CEO is sitting on a couple of steering committees and is tracking progress. And you can tell who sees that as an IT project and who sees it as a, as a technology-driven, full-scale business transformation. So enthusiastically, I think the key word is they're, first of all, they're excited about it, but also they're personally engaged. They're actually, and, sure. and, and from experience, I'll tell you right now, the most successful projects are when the board or the CEO specifically and the C-level are fully engaged in supporting the CIO or the chief digital officer in the implementation. I think it's such, it's such a missed opportunity when that doesn't happen. We see it all the time, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a foundational part for success for sure. Yeah, one of the great examples, you mentioned ATB earlier, so yeah. ATB Financial out of uh, Alberta. Uh, they have Chief uh, Transformation Officer, Wellington Holbrook. He is enthusiastically engaged, and when we <coughs> interviewed him, um, you know, the note-taking was like through, through the roof just because of all the quotes and interesting tidbits that he shared. One of the most compelling ones, and it's, it's in the study that's going to be uh, unveiled on Thursday, is uh, they ran 20,000 um, predictive recommendations to their customers weekly, and they had a 47% uptake of those uh, offers. So that was um, way beyond their expectations, and it was something they could not, simply could not do because of scale and, and data challenges two years prior. So he was enthusiastic about that, and, and the engine there is just is continuing to, to motor along. The other thing it does is when you're, when you're working through some of the uh, customer experience um, frameworks, you also want to reduce the calls to call contact centers. So, um, you know, trouble logging in, so forth. All of these things are now being predicted so they can improve the customer experience to improve offer uptake, but also reduce that um, contact centered loading of calls and complaints and so forth. So, those are two key metrics for ATB Financial. Great. Right. Um, I'm going to ask you for any other insights that you, you, uh, you found coming out of the survey that we might have not touched on. But I don't know if, we, do we have time to, I think we have like probably five minutes. Uh, maybe we'll open, 10? 10, ten? Ten so minutes, maybe yeah. we'll just open it up for, for, for discussion, uh, whether it's on the presentation or the, uh, or the survey. Uh, if you guys have any questions <clears throat> to, uh, to Tony or for me, uh, we, you know, we'd just like to have a two-way discussion with you. I've got 10 minutes, I've got plenty of time to wait for your questions. It's Blaine. Are you releasing the results of this survey sometime soon, or yeah, uh, Thursday it? morning? Is that right, oh, Doug? Cool. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are the first to hear about it, actually. <laughs> and I, I would uh, I would recommend that when you go through the results, you actually look at the previous year's results as well. <clears throat> the nice thing about the survey is that <clears throat> it's the only one I know in Canada that measures the progression consistently year over year. When we did it, the first year was was good. But now that you can measure the trends, you can see where different companies are going and, and what are the different things and tactics that they're kind of pivoting to, to, uh, to succeed. It's, uh, that's been very insightful as, you know, coming out of this year's survey. Yes. It's, it's Lars uh, with IDC. So, Maybe for Sam, over the years with SAP, could you comment on how you see things changing? So uh, we, you've given us some very interesting examples here, but what do you, when you talk to, you know, obviously, a lot of Canadian enterprises are SAP customers at different levels. What, from your point of view, what's the technology challenges that they are primarily facing? You talked about three, three out of four potential failures if you're going to, to HANA in, in terms of data. What are some of the other things that you see change over the last four years and around that, just yeah. from a Canadian customer point of view? Yeah. I think um, one of the uh, most basic things is that a lot of enterprise customers, uh, especially in the technology side of the business, they're a bit overwhelmed with the expectation that is asked of them. Uh, when they, when everyone, when their CEO see stories like this, right? Like, what's the next level of innovation I can drive in my organization? And while they know that there is, as I mentioned before, there are so many things that they can do, um, low-hanging fruits that can create a ton of value before they do that. And the biggest challenge that we're seeing customers facing is that how do I balance these two things? Um, and that 
in return reflects back on SAP because we need to help them on both sides. So it's been very interesting to see, and I've been with SAP for almost seven years now. When I joined SAP, ERP was probably 70, 80% of our revenue. Today it's less than 50. Uh, because we realized that we had to make a lot of investments in where, 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 the, where, the, technology, where the technology world is going. Um, and we did that in two kind of, I would say, not waves, but two parallel streams. One of them was on the productivity side, where it wasn't only about ERP. You know, customers wanted us to help them engage their customers better. Uh, they wanted us to help them manage their spend and create more synergies and savings from their spend. spend, uh, their spend. Um, they also wanted us to engage their customers better and create these memorable experiences. All of these things that I talked about. We just listened to all of these things that are you know, unfolding in, in the digital world. And over the last seven, eight years, it's been an incredible journey in terms of either developing some of these solutions in-house or uh, buying some companies that would give us a, you know, a you know, faster time to market advantage. <clears throat> in doing that, we also pivoted from being a company that, and you know, talk about business models. We, we had to change our business model internally where we were primarily driven by selling what we call on-premise software, <clears throat> not cloud solutions, and the market was going cloud. And we had to take a fundamental decision from a strategy standpoint, are we gonna go all cloud or all on-premise? And what we decided to do is to offer our customers both options based on their needs, because some of them the government, for example, wouldn't want, you know, there are a lot of security concerns on cloud yet and, you know, data residency and all that. So different, so we, we, we decided to give both options, but when we did that, pivoting to the cloud, you're moving from uh, a diff completely different revenue accounting system to a new one that is based on subscription and renewals. So it was a complete pivot in our business model internally that created a lot of uh, uh, challenges that way. The, the second stream in parallel to this was the innovation stream. And how do you in an enterprise world, create, use AI and machine learning and 3D printing and all of these things to create value at enterprise level. And uh, because all of the stories that we hear about as consumers, we hear about them in B2C businesses. Customers, like businesses are serving consumers directly. We don't serve consumers directly. We serve businesses that serve consumers. So how do you use AI and machine learning in that context? And it was all about embedding all of that technology within the enterprise software. So that invoice matching that I was, I was talking about, it's all about how do you put machine learning within an ERP system to help you do that invoice matching? Or how do you use AI to help you uh, detect bias when you're uh, scanning resumes in an HR enterprise system? And so like, there's so many different examples of that. So changing that mentality and being able to, from an engineering standpoint, re-engineer some of our products and infuse some of these capabilities to give very innovative use cases in enterprise software. I would say these two things were probably challenges, but exciting journeys that we've been on to get to the point that we're at today. Does that answer your question? Right. Right. Question from Joe. Hi, this is Joe Pucciarelli. So, you know, we opened up with uh, the comment, uh, number one finding was uh, the striving and the need for more agility. So I was wondering if uh, either of you both could comment on, you know, how we're how we going to respond to that, that executive mandate to accelerate the speed of change inside of our organizations to meet the imperatives? I'll go first. Yeah, Joe, that's a great question. One of the uh, key questions we, we asked was, is your organization willing to essentially hire and fire as needed to, to have the right skills and talent mix? And the IE leaders were far more likely to say absolutely yes. So. It is a, it's a skills mix, is a big part of that equation um, to become more agile. And then just to add to that is some of the building blocks. So I think around that is the importance of getting your data in order and also you know, involving the entire um, set of stakeholders collaboratively. So using the, the technologies that are available to you to become agile. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I don't think it's technology driven. I think it's, it's human driven and it goes back to the executive sponsorship. They, like a lot of executives would want the IT shops or the, uh, the digital organizations to be more agile, but they don't walk that walk. And you know, once, once we're about to actually launch something, the level of involvement and sponsorship wouldn't be, in most cases, as, as we need it to be for them to go fast. I, one example that I, I really like, without mentioning the name of the company, but one of the largest oil and gas companies out west 
<clears throat> their CEO is out talking about the digital transformation they're about to embark almost every two, three weeks. Every single person in the organization knows that this is going to happen. And it's going to happen fast. And we all have to be behind it. So that top-down, Joe, like that top-down sponsorship, I know that we talked about it, but I can't stress enough on how important it is to happen. Technology is there. Resources are there. If you have a CEO who's that serious about it, you can, I wouldn't say how on fire, I would say repurpose some of the resources um, based on where the need is, and that would help you go fast. Uh, I would, like there are so many other reasons, but I would say by far, this is the, the one that we're seeing having the most impact for companies to go faster. The final comments? Yeah, just two closing comments uh, that really stood out for me. Um, again, looking at the 12% that were leaders, um, one that surprised me is when we asked them to characterize their, their approach to transformation, they were continuous and incremental rather than just focusing on a big bang project. So this notion that everything's got to, you know, you're gonna have to completely uh, tear down your organization and rebuild it, that's not what the, the leaders are showing us in Canada. It's incremental and continuous. And tied to that is they have internalized the need to innovate and transform and grow rather than being reactive to those people reading the magazine articles on the plane. They have internalized it and they've justified it and they're de deliberate about their change. So they're not just in reaction mode, um, panicking because of the next disruptive technology. So that tells me a lot about you know, the state of maturity. That is, that's being thoughtful and being deliberate and strategic rather than reactive. For me, it was, it was great being with you guys. I think this is the second time I'm in, in, I'm in ET. And uh, I know that Jared, Kathy, Anthony, and what am I missing? And Kristen, uh, they're on the SAP team. They're all industry experts. So I think there will be more round table, more intimate kind of like smaller discussions about specific industries, the industries that you guys might be coming from. And they will have more uh, examples on, um, you know, on, on the things that we talked about. So looking forward to engaging with all of you today. Thanks for having us and uh, looking forward to next year. Thank you, Sam.